got 15 minutes to talk about my favourite thing in the entire world, which is diabetes in dogs and cats, um, and which basically means that I'm going to talk about fat cats and thin dogs. And if you look at every textbook, almost every paper that is written on diabetes in dogs and cats, um, this is what you're told, um, that dogs get type 1 diabetes and cats get type 2 diabetes. And, and the reason why they're even classified that way is because um, as vets what we typically do is we try and relate the diseases in our species to diseases in people because there is so much more focus on human diseases and we want our species that we treat, we want them to have diseases that are analogous to human diseases. It, it, it's, it's, um, it helps us get funding for research, it helps us, we think, to understand how to treat our patients. And so this is why we talk in these ways. But let's talk about this a little bit more. What I've got here is four graphs. On the top there's cats and on the bottom there's dogs. And what these graphs show is the insulin response to a maximum stimulation with glucose. So glucose is given at time zero and the insulin concentration in circulation is tracked over time. I will note um, uh, that the axes are, the scale on each of the axes is exactly the same. So it's time on the bottom going out to 175 minutes and it's insulin concentration on the y-axis going up to 150. And, um, and so what happens with obesity or with increasing adiposity uh, is that there is insulin resistance. And this is something that happens in all species. And dogs, cats, people, all species, it's, it's inevitable. And um, there's a very, very strong link between the obesity-related insulin resistance and the huge upsurge in type 2 diabetes in the human population. And what happens in cats is actually very similar to what happens in people. So what, when glu a glucose stimulation is given, the beta cell releases two phases of insulin secretion. So there is the first phase of insulin secretion followed by the second phase of insulin secretion. And with obesity, these are non-diabetic cats, so these are just overweight cats. Um, what tends to happen is that there is loss of the first phase insulin secretion, so the beta cells do not work as well in the face of obesity as they do when um, in lean animals. And there is a pro prolongation of the second phase of insulin secretion. And this is the same thing that happens in obese people who are prone to developing type 2 diabetes. And so this is the basis for us um, declaring that cats get a form of diabetes or have the same mechanisms involved in the, in the development of diabetes as with type 2 diabetes. Um, what I've always been interested in is how dogs compare. And dogs are very interesting. You have to take a lot of blood samples early on after the glucose challenge to actually capture the first phase of insulin secretion in dogs. It's really rapid. It happens within five minutes and it's over and done with and then they surge into their second phase of insulin secretion and they are really efficient at it and it's all over and done with in a much shorter period of time than is typically seen in cats. And um, so dog beta cells, like super beta cells, they're very, very good at producing insulin in response to a glucose challenge. And this is highlighted when you compare what happens in obese dogs. Now these dogs are dogs, these are not experimental dogs that had induced obesity. These are spontaneously obese pet dogs, all of whom had been obese for years at the time of the study. And uh, what you can see is after years of obesity associated insulin resistance, all dogs do, what their beta cells do is they just keep on pumping out insulin in response to that insulin resistance and they just get, they have an exaggerated first phase insulin response and then they have their second phase insulin secretion and it's all over in the same period of time more or less as lean dogs. So I became really interested in this very early on in my PhD and did lots of um, follow-up research trying to investigate that because I thought that if I could show why dogs did not get type 2 diabetes, I would find something that would be really useful for the world. But I, was, I think I was thinking about that the wrong way. And that's because 
I was assuming that type 2 diabetes happened in all other species. Now, as far as I'm aware, the only non-primate mammal that's been documented to get type 2 diabetes are cats. So cats are the ones that are interesting. Dogs are perhaps just normal. And so what we have here is a situation with a very important human disease, type 2 diabetes, and the same disease in cats. Why? And I, and I don't know the answer, but I think that perhaps what I'm encouraging you to do is to ask the right question. And some, there's a theory that really appeals to me, and, um, and I know that people who are less obsessed with glucose homeostasis than I am probably need to really think about this a little bit. But um, there is a theory that the high dietary protein requirement of cats, and we've talked a little bit about that already today, is required to support hepatic gluconeogenesis to supply the glucose to their big brains. I'll break that down. So there's been a very elegant study published where they did brain, brain scanning, calculated brain volume in a number of domesticated mammals, uh, including the cat. And in relation to body size, cats have got big brains. And the main energy source that's required to keep a big brain going is glucose. The brain can use other energy sources, but it doesn't like to. What really works well is glucose. The other thing that cats need glucose for is for the type of physical activity that they tend to do. So in other words, cats um, do bursts of anaerobic exercise and that tends to be fueled by glucose surge. And so what that means is in order to keep their big brains going and their, that have, be able to switch on hepatic gluconeogenesis so that they can run away or pounce on something if they need to, they need to be able to um, quickly uh, keep going uh, glucose metabolism. Now these are carnivores, so they do not naturally eat carbohydrate. So what they need to do is they need to have hepatic gluconeogenesis. So cats are programmed to be very bad at switching off hepatic gluconeogenesis. They're very good at switching it on. Now, carbohydrate is not available to them um, ordinarily as a, as a source for hepatic gluconeogenesis. So what they tend to use is protein, amino acids broken down from dietary protein. That is, they need insulin to metabolise the protein to amino acids and then to, and then to bring it into the liver to um, begin hepatic gluconeogenesis. And so insulin is secreted to deal with their dietary protein and yet there has to be resistance of the effect of insulin on hepatic gluconeogenesis so that the hepatic gluconeogenesis is not switched off by insulin. Um, I like this theory. I like this theory because I like cats and I think that the idea of cats having big brains and needing a lot, being able to have a good source of making glucose and a good system of, of, of turning dietary protein into smart, intelligent brains, that really appeals to me. I have no idea if it's true or not. It's just a theory. It's never been proven. There's lots of different theories. But I just want to propose it and get us thinking about this because I think this is a very interesting topic. And I think that the purpose of this meeting is also to think about what can we learn from cats. Um, now one thing about cats and dogs is that the genetics of the different breeds are actually very, the, the, um, can, uh, a useful research tool uh, to identify uh, when there's breed, pre breed pre predispositions for certain diseases, looking at the genetics of, of those breeds compared with other breeds of animals is a, is, can give us clues as to what might be the genetic basis for these diseases. And we know that in Burmese cats, um, they are genetically predisposed to feline diabetes, um, and so that would be a place to look perhaps for um, causes of type 2 diabetes. That might be the same as what happens in some groups of people that are prone to type 2 diabetes. The other primary difference between treating type 2 diabetes in cats and treating type 2 diabetes in people is that the primary treatment that we use is insulin treatment. And this is largely because it's much, much easier to give a cat an insulin injection than it is to give them a pill. 
Uh, and whereas in people, the, the starting point is lifestyle mod modification, and then there's a whole range of oral meds that are considered before insulin treatment is started. And so perhaps we can learn things from, from the way we treat cats. The other thing that we, is a key point to treating diabetes in cats is that we tend to recommend a low carbohydrate diet. It's very easy to do in a carnivore. They tolerate restricted carbohydrate very easily and it seems to help with diabetic control. Now, what we, what we achieve a lot of the time when we treat cats with insulin is remission. And this is typically achieved within a few months and afterwards cats remain well without any medication requirement at all for months or years or sometimes <coughs> for the rest of their life. And so that's a really, really good outcome that we achieve with the way we treat them. However, if they do not go into remission and they stay on insulin, they have exactly the same uh, major side effect that people have when they go into insulin treatment, and that is hypoglycemia. And hypoglycemia can cause neuroglycopenia, so in other words, neurologic signs um, all, um, with altered mentation and seizures, which are very serious and can be life-threatening. But the other thing that hypoglycemia can do is uh, induce a rebound hyperglycemia, and, um, which is sometimes called the Samogi effect. And I think that there is a lot of um, talk about whether or not Samogi happens or not. Um, in the human literature, there's um, suggestion that it doesn't really play much of a feature in insulin-treated patients. Um, and I think there are, there's, there's a feeling that cats are far less prone to Samogi effect or, or hypoglycemia-induced hypoglycemia than dogs are. And, and I guess I think that we should keep it at the forefront of our minds. And I, the one thing that um, my experience has shown is that if hypoglycemia is going to occur, it is most likely to occur in the early hours of the morning. And what that means is that daytime monitoring of blood glucose rarely picks it up, whether it's in the clinic or whether it's at home. And the other thing is that if the, the hypoglycemia is very brief and stimulates a burst of hypoglycemia that lasts for several days, um, Tests such as fructosamine and glycosylated haemoglobin are also of no value in detecting this. This is Mia. Um, this is a, um, a, she's a 12-year-old spayed female Burmese cat. I have been struggling with trying to get good diabetic control on this cat for a very long time. I've worked hard. I have ruled out concurrent disease. I have got her, uh, she was on Glargine insulin for a long time, she's currently on Detamir insulin which is a, you know, I was hoping might have a better effect in her. I'm using an insulin dosing pen, a flex pen, in order to get accurate dosing. Her owners do home monitoring of her blood glucose every single day and I could not work out why I could not get control on this cat. This cat often has a blood glucose that's more than 30 millimoles per litre. So what I did was I had her in hospital for a week and what you can see here is a graph. It's probably very difficult for you to see. I just want you to get a general impression of this graph. Um, these are her blood glucose measurements day and night over a week. And she started off um, having blood glucose. So this is these little marks here on the x-axis are midday, midnight, midday, midnight, and so on over the whole week. She was given insulin at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Um, for the first few days, we followed the exact protocol that was being used at that time at home. And she started off with blood glucose that was between 10 and 20 millimoles per litre. And I thought, oh, you know, I'm pretty happy with that. And then it shot up. Then it came down. And I want to point out that these, this period of hypoglycemia and this period of hypoglycemia both occurred in the early hours of the morning and would have been very easily missed. Um, I had, a, had the overnight nurses prime to say I really want a lot of samples collected at this time um, and I managed to collect, connect, uh, um, uh, uh, record one here and one here. At this point in time, which is 8pm, I decreased her dose by 50% and as you can see, she then had a period where her blood glucose stayed at about 30 for several days but just at the point when I thought I had learned as much as I could and I was going to send her home, this is what happened on the final day. She did not become hypoglycemic, but it's 
clear that she could again. And I have now got this cat, I, and I have not succeeded in getting control of this cat, but I think that um, I just was impressed myself with the information that I got from this monitoring, and I think that um, talking about uh, um, hypoglycemia in our patients as well as human patients and the Samogi effect is perhaps useful. And I just wanted to mention that there is a new insulin treatment not currently available in Australia, Degludec, um, which, I, which has some very promising um, uh, if, uh, reports in people of being able to control blood glucose with minim minimal um, hypoglycemia, and I'm looking forward to being able to try that in cats. I do want to go on to dogs now, and I'll try and make this quick. Um, dogs do not get type 2 diabetes. They do get type 1 diabetes. There's quite good evidence to support that. It's probably most similar to the latent autoimmune diabetes of adults, which is a form of type 1 diabetes in people. They also get diestrous um, diabetes, which is the same as gestational diabetes. The interesting thing with dogs is that intact female dogs um, go through a hormonal cycle every six months, whether they're pregnant or not, which is the same as pregnancy. So they essentially have the hormones of pregnancy twice a year. And so gestational diabetes is much more common in intact females um, than um, you would imagine. But what I will talk about, if we have time, is um, chronic pancreatitis. Um, we think that about one third of diabetic dogs have chronic diabetes that is caused by chronic pancreatitis. And I think I've now got to the point where I've seen enough of these and I think I can see, beginning to see breed differences potentially. And what I will do is just run through um, a case and then give you some, the tips that I have at the moment for managing chronic pancreatitis in dogs. Elliot is an eight-year-old castrated bow West Highland White Cross. I know he doesn't look like a West Highland White Cross, but you know what it's like. Whatever the owners say is what they are. <laughs> this is um, photos that were taken of him in March 2013. He is the thinnest dog I have ever seen. He had a body condition score of one out of nine. At that point, he had been diabetic for 12 months. He had become diabetic because of an episode of pancreatitis associated with a diabetic ketoacidosis. And during the previous 12 months, he'd had episodic diarrhoea. There'd been a lot of focus on blood glucose curves and adjusting his insulin dose. But um, nobody apparently had recognised how thin this dog was getting. He was very thin. Seven months later, after I'd been treating him, I'm very proud to show these photos. He had a body condition score of five out of nine, an ideal body condition. It took, um, that's how long it took for him to gain weight. He'd had, he was still continuing to have episodes of diarrhoea, but he had never had inappetence or vomiting. So he had not, since the, the couple of episodes early on near the diagnosis of diabetes, which had been typical of pancreatitis, after that it had just simply been episodic diarrhoea. This photo I took a week ago, he's overweight. I've only had two dogs with diabetes and EPI that have, I've achieved to manage to get to the point that they're overweight. Um, he's now got a body condition score of six out of nine. And the interesting thing to my mind is that he no longer has episodic diarrhoea. He has a decreased insulin requirement. And it's my theory that this is what happens when their pancreatitis finally burns out and they've got no pancreas left at all. They become really easy patients to manage. And this is almost this is 18 months, two years after the onset of diabetes. And so what I have now become very curious about is how do we recognise these cases earlier? How do we stop them getting to the point where they've got a body condition score of one out of nine? This is Jasmine. She's an eight-year-old spayed female toy poodle cross. Um, this photo of her with a ball in her mouth. She is ball obsessed. She can play with a ball by herself for hours. And the one thing about her is that that is noteworthy is that she has episodic inappetence and she always has ketonuria. She, um, she, despite the fact that she's got really, really good diabetic control and she has a high calorie requirement. And she has responded remarkably to treatment with pancreatic enzymes. All of those problems have resolved. Her coat is softer. Um, everything about her is better. Um, but she's having, needing quite a high dose as well of, of Creon to get that result. So these are my tips, and this is my last slide. 
TLI is not a reliable test for chronic pancreatitis, for identifying exocrine pancreatic insufficiency in chronic pancreatitis. Um, it seems to me that um, you can have a low result, a normal result, or a high result. The ones that have the high result are the ones that are most likely to be plagued with intermittent um, per periods of inappetence. My drug of choice is for, treat for pancreatic enzyme sub supplementation is Creon. I tend to use a therapeutic trial a lot um, and see a response within one or two weeks, which is convincing. And a lot of these dogs, especially the ones with poor appetite, will not tolerate dietary fat restriction. They'll, eat very, they'll only eat very high fat diets, and we have to work with that, but they do need very high Creon doses. And Meropotent, or Serenia, is the saviour of these dogs. Um, uh, that you can keep them eating. And some dogs, I've had dogs on Meropotent um, for, you know, every day or every second day for long periods of time, and it really just turns them around sometimes. Thank you very much.